Hi everyone, Fide Master Dennis Monacruz is here, and today we're going to do another viewer question show. So last time we did some viewer games, this time we'll answer some questions. And, um, well, let's go ahead and start. So the first couple of questions are uh, more general, and then we get to some specific chess questions after that. So the first one comes from Hitchhiker, and he has two questions about intuition. So the first one he says is this, or the first one he offers is this. He says, when I play, I often look at the position after my opponent made a move, and I immediately know the strongest move. I'm absolutely sure. Then I suddenly forget the move and start to think about features of the position, and so on, and I end up playing a completely different move. It's almost as if my mind drowns out my intuition. Only when I analyze my games do I remember the moves that I thought about. My engine almost always confirms that I was right. Is there any good way to access my intuition? What do you do if your intuition kicks in? Okay, well... I think there's a useful, not really a definition exactly, but a, a useful way of thinking about intuition that comes from um, Viswanathan Anand. And he says that intuition is the first move I think of. So essentially it's, uh, you know, it kind of bubbles up based on all of your, your tacit knowledge, all the things that you know without necessarily formulating out loud or, or to yourself, just your uh, what was based on your, your basic background understanding of the game and your previous reflections on the particular position. And I would say that you should treat it kind of like the way, um, if you remember, I don't know if you're a student now, but um, when you were a student, you were probably told by, by teachers sometimes, if it was, um, especially if it was a multiple choice question, to go with your first instinct, right? So it's, um, it's not infallible, but I would say this, that unless you have a good reason to distrust your intuition, um, I would go with that move. So don't necessarily just play it right away. I mean, you don't have to make your tournament games into five-minute games or, or bullet games. But I would try to have the attitude, okay, uh, if, if your intuition seems to you to be generally trustworthy, as far as you can tell from your past games, checking with the computer and so on, then, again, have the attitude that it's innocent until proven guilty. And then what I would do, you know, I would try that, and I would see where it lets me down and try to figure out, okay, what circumstances are such that my intuition is not really as trustworthy as it is in others. So figure out where your, in, where your intuition tends to be reliable, where it tends to be less reliable. And, um, you know, maybe in those kinds of circumstances, then maybe be a bit more patient, not only from the standpoint of trying to disprove or at least confirm or double check your intuition, but maybe trying to, to find something else. But generally speaking, you know, give yourself the benefit of the doubt. If your intuition seems to be reliable, and especially if it's a situation where, as far as you can tell, in the past, it's it tends to be reliable, then, you know, just make a, make a quick check, make sure, you know, see what your opponent's up to, but then go with it if you don't have any good reason not to do so. Okay, his follow-up is this. He says, um, it's more general. He says, if my intuition tells me a move, but I can't see how it works, should I go ahead and play it anyway, hoping to figure out the rest later? Or should I sit down and calculate until I figure out or find out how exactly it works? Well, here I would say that it depends. If it's a very committal move, so if, if the move that first comes to mind is a very high-risk move, if it's the sort of move that uh, is burning some bridges, then, yeah, you should definitely try to work things out. So, I, I mean, what, what I'm saying when I'm telling you to uh, to have a kind of an innocent until proven guilty attitude towards your intuition, what I'm not saying is that um, you should just give yourself a blank check, but that you should at least assume that it's right. But look at the board, right? So you're, you're assuming it's right, but you're still going to try to disprove it. You're still going to check and and see, you know, does does this does this meet snuff? Is it up to snuff? Um, in terms of the tactics on the board, does it take care of whatever my opponent's threatening with his last move or with his general plan? So um, the same thing here, and I would say again, especially if it's very, very committal, um, if it's the sort of thing where other moves will keep a reasonable position or an advantage, basically maintain the status quo, while the move that your intuition is telling you to play um, really makes things kind of um, murky and could end up disastrous, could work work out very poorly. So in those circumstances, be extra careful. But again, I would still say if you think your intuition is reliable in general, then um, 
have have a, a fairly high degree of confidence in it and um, you know don't be afraid to go with it okay so that I hope is helpful next question comes from Spree who says he's 13 years old and rated around 50, uh, 1950 he's preparing for Super Nationals in April that's um, a big scholastic event here in the United States and he says I should be a relatively high seat in my section so I was wondering if you had any advice about preparing for a big open tournament and then he has a second question after that. So the first question, or the first, um, my answer to the first question is, sure, I've got lots of advice. And, and the first bit of advice would be to take lessons from someone, perhaps the person giving this show. Uh, okay, that's that's two-thirds of joking. Uh, I actually don't think that's such a bad idea. But, um, but, but the serious advice, I would say, is this, that uh, first of all, you should, of course, be well-prepared for your openings. Uh, and also try to know something new, especially if there are people there that are going to be well prepared for you. Now, actually, I think you're in a pretty good position because you're fairly high rated, but you're not one of the absolute top guys. So you'll kind of fly under the radar, I think. I mean, unless there are people in your area who are also playing and who know you, chances are, uh, other than those guys, no one's going to even bother to prep for you. So that's kind of a nice, a nice position. So you're one of the better players. But because you're not one of the absolutely highest rated players, you may, you may again, basically be uh, neglected in terms of other people's preparation. So that's kind of a good thing. And um, so I would say, you know, obviously be, be ready with your openings, especially if you play super sharp stuff. Um, maybe prepare a little bit. I mean, it's getting a little bit late now, but if you can prepare some, some sidelines that are reliable – and to have those as a as a little surprise again, as long as you you feel comfortable uh, with it by the time the tournament rolls around, uh, don't don't just come up with some new system that you don't know and and, and trot it out there for big games. That would be a, a bad thing to do. But if there's something that is kind of a, a plan B that you um, kind of have ready, it might not be such a bad idea to be able to switch to that because you know as the rounds go on, I mean the people who are on the higher boards are going to browse your games and. Uh, may have some idea, and their coaches might spy on you and uh, try to prep something. So it's not bad to have a, a little plan B opening here or there. Okay, so that's one thing. I mean, of course, you should try to be in good good form tactically, so, you know, practice your tactics. Um, you know, don't don't drive yourself, um, don't, don't wear yourself out and um, reduce your attention span for the tournament by playing too much blitz and bullet and, uh, and bug house. So, you know, a little of that's fine, but uh, remember what you're there for. So if you're if you're there to try to win, win the big stuff, then you know treat it treat it seriously. Um, what else? You know get get plenty of sleep. I mean that's always really important. Get some exercise. So um, and and um, you know don't eat really horribly. So uh, there was a good article in Chess Life about eating for tournaments, and uh, I would say you know review that and try to adapt that to your own your own tastes and what you're able to do. Okay, so let's um, go on to the second part of the question, which is this. He says, I also have a question chess-wise. I tend to be a very aggressive player, often making shaky sacks. Should I try to play differently against significantly lower-rated players? Any other advice would be great. Thanks. Okay, so um, significantly lower-rated players, what do you do? Well, I would, I would just say this. What do you do that is normally most effective against significantly lower-rated players? So my attitude when I'm playing someone significantly lower-rated is that I don't want to do anything crazy, uh, especially with black. Um, so I just want to get a normal, normal kind of position where basically the fact that I know an awful lot more than people who are an awful lot lower rated than I am should be enough to win the game as long as I don't fall asleep tactically. So when I'm playing someone significantly weaker, I, I just play, I play good moves, but I'll do, you know, a couple things I'll, I'll try to make sure I do is to avoid what might there might be their pet line if I can't. So if someone plays some kind of crazy gambit variation, even if I think it's a pretty lousy opening, if there's a safe way for me to avoid it where I can still get equality, then I'll do that. Um, you know, I don't I don't think there's any reason L let's say okay, so let's say to give one example, let's suppose my opponent plays the Black Redeemer Gambit. Okay, so I'm black and, and they play play the Black Redeemer. All right. Well, I don't really think that. <clears throat> excuse me. I don't really think that highly about that opening. Um, I mean, it, it has its tricks, though. But I mean, I think objectively, black should be at least equal. Um, maybe I should just say equal. Okay. So I'll, I'll be be generous. And um, but 
okay, my, my results against it in Blitz are very good, but, <clears throat> excuse me, if someone, let's say, rated 1,900 or 2,000, plays it against me, or even lower, um, 1,800, 1,700, uh, I may just decline it, all right? I might play a Carol Can against it, or, or some, some Dodge, maybe play a French. And the point is that if I play something sound, I'll know it to some extent, okay? Um, I may not be an expert in one of those openings, but I know it. I know something about it. I, I've played it before, and I've I've um, I've certainly faced it many times. And I basically know that okay, a player who's five four hundred points lower rated than I am, unless I again just have some kind of horrible day, or I just blunder atrociously, I'm going to beat them. All right. I mean, it's very very unlikely that I won't beat them. I mean, that's just what the rating system means. That when you play someone with that big of a gap, you ought to you ought to win the overwhelming percentage of the time. So, by avoiding the one thing that they may know really well, I'm taking away their their only really good chance to beat me. Unless again, I have just a, an absolute meltdown. So I would say to do the same thing, um, unless you feel like you're a really bad positional player and you're just a really great tactical player. In that case, you should just play tactically, right? So do whatever is is going to make you is going to give you the the safest chance to pass through without something bad happening. So, you know, if, if what you're calling shaky sacrifices is how you beat everybody, well, maybe that's what you should do. But generally speaking, <clears throat> I would say if you've got a big rating advantage, it's because you know a lot more about chess than they do and, and play to that. So um, <clears throat> let them hang themselves. You don't have to um, go crazy to beat them. Okay, and any other advice? Well, I mean, lots of other advice is possible, but I mean, I think that's pretty, I mean, I think that's all the advice you need for just a, a quick little touch-up before a tournament. So uh, the other thing I would say, and I, I recommend this to everybody, when you're playing up, play what you know. Okay, so for some bizarre reason, when people play up, they often do this. I, I think I might have mentioned this before on a previous show. They'll, they'll do... Um, you know, I think I've called this the reverse peekaboo or something. So, you know, a little kid, when they play peekaboo, they, they cover, when, when you cover their eyes or when they cover their eyes, I mean, really young kids, they think that you've disappeared. So it's, it's not that you've disappeared. They just can't see you. So what happens with lower rated players when they're playing way up is they think, okay, if I play this, whatever this is, referring to their main opening, then the other guy's going to know what much better than I do. So I'm going to play this other thing, which I don't know absolutely nothing about. All right. It's, just really an idiotic thing to do, but I mean everyone probably does it, or you know at least at some point or other in their in their chess career. But it's it's crazy. I mean, why would you think that um, they don't know this crazy thing? You know, if, if you if you even know about it, they probably know about it, and they may if they're better in general than you are, then they're probably going to know more about it than you do. So play what you know best. I mean that's what's going to give you your best chance. Um, when you're playing up. Okay, so I hope that helps, and good luck. All right, so let's um, take a look at some specifically chess questions now. This first one is from King Hunter, and it's a variation of the Accelerated Dragon. It goes like this. Okay, now here the most common move is bishop to c4. But that's not what we're looking at. So he's looking at f4. All right, so this is kind of a sideline. Uh, normally, I would say black's move is d6, threatening knight to g4. And then after bishop to d2, simply castling. And this is just a main line of the, uh, an old main line of the dragon. Uh, of course, it's not the, the absolute main line, but that's the Yugoslav with f3 and queen d2 and so on. But, uh, but this is still a very important line as well, a classical dragon here. Uh, but okay, the line he wants to look at goes with castling here. And now white plays bishop to e2. And now instead of d6, which would again transpose into the classical dragon, d5. Okay, and then e5, knight e4. And okay, so King Hunter says, this position, the position looks strange, and I do not see the reason for the playability of such a pawn structure. Can you perhaps point out some reasons? Well, okay, there's nothing wrong with the pawn structure yet. It's the pawn structure that's about to result after... White makes some captures. So let's let's have a look. So knight e4, and let's say knight takes e4, d takes e4. 
All right, and it may seem as if this pawn on e4 is going to be a real problem for black. Okay, so what's what's justifying this this approach for black? Well, I would say it's actually not so easy to win this pawn. For one thing, there are quite a few positions where black can simply play f5, and it protects the pawn if it stays there. And if white takes ef, well, black can do the same thing and then bring the second pawn to f5. So it really isn't so simple to just win this guy outright. Also, another point in black's favor here is that the d5 square could be a useful um, useful one for the queen, among other pieces. And, um, well, I would say also this exchange frees black's position up quite a bit. So it's, it's actually not so bad. Uh, now, I, I don't think it's great. I mean, white's score from this position is generally pretty good. So he, he referred to a game between Olofsson and, and Bent Larsen, played back in 1957, which Larsen won, but that was one of the few games that Black has won in this position. So white's score is pretty good. But, I mean, I would say that white's not any more than slightly better. So um, the line can continue. Okay, so let's say, let's take a look at a direct approach. So c3 with the idea of perhaps rounding up the pawn quickly with queen c2. So knight takes d4, queen takes is probably best, takes, takes, rook d8. And now, again, if white tries to grab this pawn, for example, with bishop to d1 and then bishop c2, again, it proves not so easy. b6, bishop c2, bishop b7. And now if king to f2, followed by some rook to e1, again, black is just in time with f5. And, um, okay, if white doesn't take en passant, then, of course, the e-pawn is a protected passer. And even though white has a, a clean majority on the queen side, you can still say that black has a clean majority on the king side because his extra pawn is, is passed over there. So this really isn't bad for black at all um, if, if white doesn't take. And if he does take, well, then black's majority is clean, and he's going to play f5, and he's still in very good shape. Okay, so going back to this position, c3, this direct approach really doesn't seem very fruitful. Okay, knight takes c6, b takes c6, and this gets to the um, the main the main position. Sometimes white plays knight c6 first, and then knight takes e4, but obviously the two moves can transpose. Okay, queen d8, rook d8. Now, in the uh, olofsson larsen game, white played bishop to c4, and that game continued king f8, castles, a5, Bishop b6, rook e8, bishop c5, uh, rook to b8, a4. The idea being that if black takes on b2, white plays bishop to b3, and, and then bishop to a3 or bishop to d4 winning the exchange. So bishop f5, b3, rook e to d8, rook e to d1, and, and uh, takes, takes g5. And, okay, black managed to get some play. White's still okay here, but Larson went on to, to outplay his opponent and win. Um, but going back to this position, so queen d8, rook d8. Instead of bishop to c4, looks like the immediate bishop to c5 isn't bad. King f8, king f2, heading for e3. Say bishop to e6, king e3, rook d5, b4. I mean, I'd say around here, let's say around here, white's probably slightly better. But it's really not so easy to do something meaningful here. Now, it looks like it should be a bad position for black because the e4 pawn is isolated, the c6 pawn is isolated, the a7 pawn is isolated, this bishop on g7 seems to be kind of locked up here. But despite all of this, it's um, it's really not so, so easy. First of all, the c6 pawn isn't really a weakness because white can't get at it, at least not for the foreseeable future. And remember, a weakness is only a weakness if your opponent can get there. So a purely abstract weakness really isn't such a problem. The a7 pawn, okay, it, it for the moment at least occupies black because of the, uh, the dark squared bishop, but it'll be quite a long while before white can really um, increase any pressure on that. And black may play something like a5, a4, and put a rook on the b file, and that should take care of quite a few of his problems on the queen side. The e4 pawn is potentially a weakness, but again, it proves... Um, a little bit difficult to actually win this thing. So, all right, let's take a look at a line. So king e3, just straightforwardly going after, and it seems like it should win it because um, if f5, we just take en passant. If bishop f5, you can play g4. Bishop to d5, you can play c4. 
but we'll see. It's not so easy. So rook to d5 is good. And on, for example, b4, now f5, takes, bishop takes f6. Okay. So now the e4 pawn is definitely weak. I mean, there's not going to be any pawn protection, and it's isolated. And in fact, black has four isolated pawns. But still, he's not in such bad shape. All right, but he is, I mean, he's a little bit worse, but it's really not so serious. So for example, if rook a to d1, a5, instant counterplay. And black's bishops are both very nicely posted as well. So this is um, not so easy. And also, note that king e4, not right now, but at some point, will be met by bishop f5 and bishop c2. So you can see all of black's pieces are really very nicely placed here and, and are on active locations. So black has definite counterplay here. Uh, another possibility is c4. Okay, so then we swap a couple of pieces here, and then black gets the open file first. So rook b8, king e4, rook b2, and white's a pawn up, but black is obviously very, very active. White has some problems with his uh, pawns as well, so his a2 pawn is isolated, the c pawns are isolated. So black is probably about equal here as well. So ultimately, I mean, I think this is playable for black. I don't know that I would recommend it, but I can't say that it's bad. So if you like the positions you get, give it a try. Um, historically, white has done pretty well in the variation, but, but it's not that black is in horrible shape. I mean, it's just a slight edge for white at best, I think. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Okay, this is from Guitar Cameron, and he asked about a Kasparov simul game back in 2004, and it went like this. Okay, and here um, Kasparov played Bronstein's knight to c5, which is an interesting move. Queen b6, g4, bishop g6, f4. And here, black resigned, according to the database. And he wants to know, well, what's going on here? He says, Kaspar is probably better, okay, but was it right to give up already? The answer is no, absolutely not. And in fact, this is um, a known theoretical position. Black scores reasonably well here. And he can play both e6 <clears throat> and also h5. So h5 is another uh, move. Maybe not played right here, um, but it's it's played, I think, pretty quickly in a lot of variations. And um, yeah, and of course not here, but, but it is a common theme. And again, as I said, black score is reasonably well. I mean, in power book, I think it's 50% uh, here. So I, I suspect that what happened is either the guy had to leave or... Um, you know, the, the score sheet was just indecipherable, something along those lines, because, again, this has occurred quite a number of times in, in um, master and grandmaster play. Uh, one game you might want to look at is uh, an old classic of Bronstein's, the inventor of this this variation, played against Alexander Bilyovsky back in the Soviet Championship in 1975. So that game continued with e6, queen e2, again threatening f5, bishop e7, threatening Kind of. Well, yeah, it is threatening. Bishop to h4, check. So h4, h5. And then here Bronstein came up with a really nice idea. So you might even want to stop the recording and see if you can figure out what white played in this position. Okay, well, the answer is this. It plays f5, he takes f5, and now g5. And essentially his idea is that he wants to put a piece here on f4, and make this bishop no longer really a functioning piece. So to essentially turn it into an unpromotable pawn. So it's a, it's a very nice strategic idea, and it worked very well in the game. So we can just kind of quickly cursor through it for those of you who don't have databases. Though you can find it in online databases. But anyway, it's the game is basically all determined uh, or is decided by Bronstein's ability to effect his positional plan. Okay, so bishop to d6, black is fighting for the f4 square, so white plays queen to h2. Again, he wants to maintain control over f4, not let that bishop out. Okay, knight f8, castles, knight e6. So he's determined. He's going to get that, that bishop out of there. Takes, takes, and now bishop to c4. So black could probably play f4 here, but white would be in very good shape after knight takes f4. So he plays knight e7. Now knight f4 anyway, resuming the blockade. Takes, takes. Rook back. Takes, takes. C3. So again, black could play f4. 
White would regain the pawn, but he decides not to do it. Feels that his position is worse, so he wants to keep the pawn. Okay, and now this knight is going to reroute to f4. So again, we see this same theme at work. So either black is going to return the pawn, in which case he's got a slightly worse position. White just has more space, and it's useful space. Or he keeps the pawn, but then white keeps that bishop on g6, miserable for eternity. Okay, so knight to c8, knight to d3, knight to c6, bishop b3, rook e3, knight f4 once again, rook d to e, rook d to e8. So uh, black's pieces are all very good, with one exception. Rook h to g1, rook up, rook over, knight e4, bishop d1. Okay, so now he's hitting the h-pawn, king d6, bishop f3. So no hurry to, to reestablish material equality here. He really wants to make the most out of this blockade that he can. And there's also the threat here of knight to g2, which will perhaps simply win the exchange. So black has to be careful about that. So takes, takes, knight to g2, rook d3, knight f4. Okay, probably time pressure. I mean, Bronstein was well known for for that. But Bilyovsky decided not to repeat. And very interestingly, okay, even though black has this super active knight, has the more active king, and has an extra pawn, it doesn't matter. All right, so this this dreadful bishop on g6 is still so bad that white can afford to enter an endgame with these various deficits with confidence. Okay, so the game continues. Okay, so now, of course, white has everything. So he's got more space. His queenside majority is um, coming into play here. Okay, and finally, so here we are. Move. This is Black's 44th move. Only now is his bishop ready to come back into the game after, you know, 35 moves on the sidelines. So, yeah, it's back on move 11 that White played. Well, move 10 was f5. Let's go back to here. So this is move 10. This is move 11. And only now on move 44 does Black finally bother or have the chance, really, to get this bishop out of there. Okay, so now White exchanges. Ruining black's kingside structure, king c5, bishop f7, at last, b5, king c8, b6, and here Bilyovsky threw in the towel. So a very nice game by Bronstein and um, a wonderful strategic concept that worked to perfection. Okay, of course, the, um, the game doesn't have to go like this from the position where we started this with f4. So um, as I said, I, I think it was just either an error in the uh, in the score or Kasparov's opponent in the simul had to leave. Okay, so on to the next question, which I think is the last question. Okay, and this comes from Chess Enthusiast. All right, and he says, I saw an interesting endgame position, which I thought would be instructive to be analyzed by a master. White's, he says, little advantage lies in the three to two majority, referring to the queenside structure here. So three pawns versus these two. And he's more active with the D file. So we've got this. But, of course, white also has this weak pawn on e5. And if that falls, black has an extra pawn and a pass or two. Okay, well, I think he's done a nice job, uh, Chess Enthusiast has, of outlining some of the basic factors that are really crucial to evaluating the position. So white's got the weak pawn on e5 and the three on two majority. Okay, I don't think that's that serious, but... Uh, especially since with kings on opposite sides, I mean, you could say, well, black's got his majority as well. Um, it's interesting, this this queenside majority idea. In the early 20th century, it was thought to just be a, a really kind of significant advantage, um, especially in positions where, okay, instead of this pawn on e5, let's say this pawn is back on f2. So when you've got this four on three on the king side where, white has, uh, sorry, where black has the unopposed e pawn, and white has the three on two on the queen side, where the c pawn is the unopposed one. Um, as I said, it used to be thought that white had an edge here. I would say nowadays, I mean, of course, nowadays people will say, well, it always depends on the position. And I suppose if there's any prejudice, it might be a slight prejudice in favor of black uh, with the extra central pawn, because if these pawns get rolling here, e5, f5, and so on, let me get rid of this stuff here then the extra space advantage 
will prove much more significant, certainly in a middle game and sometimes in the end game as well. So, you know, it really all varies. It, it depends. Uh, but, okay, both sides would have their trumps in those situations. All right, well, here, black doesn't have that central majority, but the e5 pawn is a little bit weak. Now, I actually think that the position is about equal. And the problem for white is that even if he neutralizes black's, uh, or he neutralizes the problem of the e-pawn, black has all the entry points covered. So um, I think that that really limits the damage that white should be able to do here. So it's it's a playable position. I mean, certainly white can try and black can try as well. But I, I think objectively it's about equal. Now, my first idea, and my main idea, and I'm happy to say the computer liked it too and um, quickly went along with it, is this. So I thought, okay, uh, on, on two grounds. So one thing you might think is, okay, I've got this knight and g. Doesn't d6 look like a fantastic square? But the thing is, okay, you put the knight on d6, well, then what? All that does is block the d file, so you can no longer use it. Plus, let's say in some position where the knight's there, black doubles rooks on the d file, then white has to worry about knight takes e5, just winning a pawn. So this knight to d6 plan really isn't very good, in, in my opinion. Um, so I thought, okay, well, obviously I, I want to get the e5 pawn taken care of. I don't want to leave my rook there forever. I'd like to double rooks on, on the d file or do something else with it. And I think it's a useful kind of rule of thumb that you should always defend things as cheaply as possible. So if, for example, you have the, um, the, the chance to defend a pawn with another, with another pawn, you should do that. So you shouldn't, let's say, white's h-pawn were under attack from something. Okay, so let's say black had a rook on h8 and there was no, no h-pawn. Okay, so we get rid of this h-pawn, there's a rook on h8 attacking h2. What do you do in this position? Do you play rook to h1? No, of course not. You would play h3 unless there was some concrete tactical reason not to do it. So you would defend the pawn as cheaply as possible. Okay, well, let's apply that to the situation here. Since we're not going to bring the knight to d6, maybe what we should do is use the knight to defend the pawn on, on e5. So this is what I would like to play here. Knight to b5, let's say a6, and now knight to d4, followed by knight to f3. So that frees the rook to leave the e-file. I can go to the d-file or someplace else and try to make its, its uh, presence felt. However, okay, after something like rook to c8, knight f3, king f8, I'm not really sure what white is going to do. So one idea might be to play rook to d3, preparing to um, to bring the rooks into attack here on the, um, on the a or the b file, or both, maybe one in turn. But still, I think king g7, say g3, h6, and... After these little prophylactic moves, um, I don't really see what white is going to do. That's all that impressive. So I think black has everything pretty well covered. And, um, you know, so the D file is covered. The C file is, is taken care of. Uh, he can bother the queenside pawns a little bit, but black is just very well placed here and shouldn't have much difficulty. And, and black, for his part, can also try to reroute his knight, maybe knight f8, d7, c5. And, um, you know, I think it's well placed there. Uh, also, one other point is that when white's rook moves, something like rook to c5 might also be played, trying to keep white tied down to the c5 pawn. So, at the end of the day, I don't really think white has very much in this line. Okay, another try, though. Instead of having our knight tied down to the f3 pawn, why don't we get rid of the thing that's attacking it? So, one other idea that's reasonable is knight to e2 followed by knight to f4, and we exchange, or at least drive away, black's knight from g6. Okay, so black should play actively. Rook c7, knight f4, rook f to c8. Again, remember we want to defend things cheaply, so c3. And now black should activate his worst placed piece, which is the king. So king f8, white takes, black recaptures. And again, it's a roughly equal position. White maybe has a microscopic edge, but I wouldn't even say it's... If I had to put a symbol, I would put equal rather than plus equals. Um, the D file is going to be covered. The F7 pawn is, in theory, weak, but so easily defended that it's not really weak. And 
Okay, white has the three on two on the queen side. That's true. But black's rooks are both very well posted. And black might be able to put some pressure against the um, the uh, the e pawn. One thing you might play is something like this. King e7, rook c5, rook h8, hitting the h pawn. And then after h3, rook h5. And um, even from there, in addition to threatening the e pawn, the rook could also come to f5 and activate further. So there's the possibility then of something like rook to f2. So of course, this takes a few moves, but it's a reasonable plan. And because this e5 pawn is kind of a static target, it's at least a little bit challenging for white to really find too many things that are active to play here. So ultimately, I think this position uh, ought to be a draw. There's still play. Either side could win. But um, I think it's about equal. So good question. Thank you very much. And actually, this is uh, all, these are all the questions that we had for this, this time around. So thank you. And um, it'll probably be a while before I do another uh, viewer question or uh, viewer game show. But, um, but these, are, these are nice. And so I hope they're helpful to you. And um, I'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.